Welcome to the webinar, Credit Risk Management and Account Treatment in the Post-COVID World. I am Eric Steinhoff, um, EVP of Client Impact here at Synaptic. I joined Synaptic about six weeks ago. Um, prior to this, I have 21 years of experience in credit risk management, analytics, and lending strategies. Um, I've worked in banking at Capital One and Standard Bank, as well as smaller uh, lending institutions and startups um, focused primarily on consumer credit, auto lending, and SMB lending. Synaptic is a company that brings the power of AI to credit processes, and we are headquartered in New York. Uh, so this first slide should look pretty familiar to most of you who've been following the news. Uh, we are entering a new era where a significant subset of borrowers have intent but no ability to pay. We all know that delinquencies are tightly correlated with unemployment rates, repeated collections calls in this environment to people who may have lost their jobs will be ineffective and in fact can have a uh, negative impact both reputationally and um, with creating that relationship with your customers. So our recommendation is that strategies should instead consider positive impact and assistance to your customers to help them handle this crisis. And before I move on, what I wanna do is launch a poll. Um, you should be seeing that uh, pop up on your screen. There's five questions here. Um, and I will collect that information over the next few minutes. And then um, we will reveal the results over the course of this presentation. I'll also take this time to um, remind you that if you have any questions over the course of the presentation, to send those questions using the Q&A window found in the control bar below. Um, we will collect all those questions over the course of the uh, presentation and answer as many as possible when I get to the end. I'll wait another 30 seconds or so. Looks like about a third of you have voted. Okay, thank you. I will, um, you can continue to submit uh, responses over the next few slides, um, but I will go ahead and, and move on. The reason I wanted to ask, uh, submit, start the poll questions uh, before this slide was because I, I reveal here what um, our current, current outlook is, and this is based strongly on the Moody's research projections. Um, if you look at the top right, Moody's is currently expecting a swoosh shaped recovery. Um, so not a U or not a V, but kind of a delayed V that we're calling a swoosh. Um, the, um, as you can see here, the, the macroeconomic growth um, from the beginning of the recession uh, shows here that the, the, the whole dug in the first couple of quarters um, will take likely close to two years to get back to, to where we were pre-recession. Um, so that's talking, you know, end of next year. In terms of our poll results, about 56 of you, uh, more than 55 people have voted. Um, expected shape, we got a very uh, well distributed answer set. 5% of you expected an L shape, which would be the pessimists in the room. Um, the rest were almost evenly divided between the other four options, a U shape, a V shape, both received 22% swoosh 27 percent so clearly several of you have heard of that 
and uh, W shape was 23%. So um, it seems like um, the more likely uh, response, 50% of you think a swish or W. Um, if you throw V in there, that's 71%. So I think most people are expecting a relatively robust uh, recovery. Um, that said, uh, a U shape plus the L shape, 28% uh, of you think that these, uh, the recovery will, will not be very strong. Um, uh, the, uh, the other factors on here, um, just for reference, the US Consumer Confidence Index dropped very low uh, in April. And uh, at the end of this month, I expect it will probably have dropped further. Um, this is relative to a, a benchmark of uh, 1966. So you can see we were we were hovering at that benchmark level uh, over the past 12 months, and then uh, this hit and everything changed. The other uh, slide I like here in the bottom right uh, chart I like here is um, indication of and correlation of, as I referenced on the previous slide, unemployment rate with delinquency rate. And as you can see, they they walk fairly march step together. However, um, as is often seen at the end of a growth cycle, we had actually started to see delinquency rate on consumer loans tick up over the previous, say, uh, two, three years, um, while unemployment continued to go down preceding this recession. And that's not atypical, again, in a growth economy. As the growth continues, lenders continue to loosen credit policy and credit requirements to maintain or grow market share, which leads to over indebtedness. The good news is um, I, I believe we were in a much stronger position from a um, household stability and income and savings standpoint than we were heading into that previous recession, which I think is reflected in the number of you expecting a relatively robust V swoosh or W recovery. However, um, most of you are probably dealing with through the cycle models that uh, present some challenges uh, for both credit decisioning and forecasting uh, when a macro environment occurs like the one we're experiencing. So risk models are almost definitely drifting from expected paths. And that is due to most through the cycle models um, actually deliberately excluding macro elements in the makeup of the model. That said, a lot of you have um, probably overlaid um, macro indicators to help influence decisioning. I'll start to share some of the other results now that we've got 60 respondents. Um, so on the unemployment question, 10% um, of you think that we will return to an unemployment rate of 5%. I'll, I'll remind you that um, official unemployment for April was right at right below 15%. However, um, Bureau of Labor Statistics believe that was understated by approximately 5%. So we're really at a 20% unemployment rate at the end of April. Um, I, I personally think it's unlikely we'll get there by the end of uh, 2020. I think best hope is uh, late 2021. Um, that said, again, 10% of you projected unemployment returning to 5% end of 2020. Uh, another 17% in early 2021, 23% in late 2021, um, and then 50% of you think it's going to be 2022 or beyond. Um, so that breaking out into 22% in 2022 and 28% of the, um, the group thinks that this is a 2023 or beyond number, um, which would be a pretty prolonged, slow recovery path. Um, and then to the next question, which um, I'm discussing on this slide, how many of you have incorporated macroeconomic data in your credit risk decisioning models or in your logic? Uh, only 10% say yes in all models, which is not that surprising. Um, however, 50% or almost 50% have uh, overlaid macro data in some of your models, 48%, and then 43%, the remainder, no or none of your models have incorporated macroeconomic data. So um, that likely means that you're exposed and may be part of why you're attending this webinar. Um, I will say that I'm 
I'm also just uh, starved for data in this environment. I think I've gone from attending maybe five webinars in my life before March of 2020 and have uh, attended, I think on average three a week over the last four to five weeks. Um, but returning to this slide, risk models are drifting um, due to macroeconomic uh, drivers. Um, through the cycle models, we're not built to react quickly to macroeconomic shocks. In fact, they are built almost deliberately to predict uh, credit losses in a relatively benign or not changing environment uh, and models we know are inherently lagged. So models will only react when you start to see payment defaults. And one of the things we know about this recession with all the payment deferrals given by lenders is that these will likely take at least six months, potentially 12 plus months to appear on the Bureau. So your models are not going to pick up and respond quickly to the macro conditions um, or to the behavior the macro conditions are causing within your customer base. So what can we do about that? Now we believe from a customer standpoint, at least, there is an opportunity to win the long game and uh, without sacrificing much in the short term. So uh, calling that lower charge offs for you and a better experience for your customers. So analysis of modification efforts, sorry, in the 2017 hurricane season, as well as some of our preliminary analysis of 2008's recession shows that um, modified borrowers are three times more likely to avoid ultimate defaults than loans that go straight into delinquency. So the idea being here that obviously payment deferrals do delay some charge-offs, not eliminate them completely, but uh, there is now pretty strong evidence that they do prevent some charge-offs. Obviously some of those customers, even on deferrals, will eventually roll through the charge-off and uh, likely at a much higher rate than customers in a benign environment. That said, um, we think that lenders should be taking every action possible to um, defer charge-offs and um, to offer your customer base a, a lifeline or a solution to work with them to allow them to try and weather the storm and come out the other side uh, in a strong position. So here are the three steps that I'm gonna talk through over the next several slides. Number one, collate a customer-centric view across products. So unless you have, unless you're a monoline lender, um, like maybe an auto lender that would only have one loan to your customer base, there is likely a significant subset of your customers with multiple loans. And we would recommend um, trying to, as quickly as possible, generating a customer-centric view rather than treating each loan in isolation. Now that's easier said than done. Um, but there are some shortcuts you can take. Secondly, identify an overlay resiliency indicator. So I will get into what this means exactly in a few slides, but ultimately we believe there are data elements outside of the Bureau, but also leading indicators in customers' credit bureaus that can help differentiate within your portfolio customers who may be more likely to withstand the coming months than others. And so we're going to recommend a differentiated treatment for customers we are calling high resilient versus those that are not as resilient. And finally, um, implement updated exposure management tools. So traditional collections and account management tools built over the last 10 years, tools I'm talking about, things like loan modifications, things like refinance strategies, are likely not optimized for the type of downturn that we're encountering. And we believe that that uh, warrants a review and update given the, the current scenario. So customer 360, uh, incorporate alternative data sources to update your customer financial profile. What does this mean? So one, um, one thing that I think a lot of lenders have thought about doing but have been um, again, is easier said than done to implement, is um, are you capturing information directly provided by your customer base? So most lenders are dealing with customers phoning in, requesting payment relief, requesting payment deferrals. Um, while on those calls, uh, that is a, a real opportunity to capture not just information about what they need, but information about their outlook. Um, and so things like 
job or employment status, household income outlook. And I say household because um, you know most households have two incomes. And if you uh, if you're talking to someone who may have lost their job or been furloughed, um, maybe their spouse is continuing to receive employment or vice versa. So I think it's important to collect that information in trying to understand your customers, which will help you down the line. Um, another big difference, as we talked about, I alluded to earlier in the um, current macro scenario relative to 2008, is that there is just a lot more equity in home ownership than there was in 2008. This means that personal household balance sheets are stronger than they were. And um, there are some indicators you can get either by talking to your customers or even by looking at um, data available on bureaus or other alternative public records, time and residence, and whether they rent or own their home. Um, you can try to approximate LTV using those data points, but that can really um, help understand, is this a customer who has a relatively strong household balance sheet or are they potentially um, stretched thin and or over levered and that would indicate less likely to be resilient over the coming months. Um, over on the right, there are alternative data sources that uh, we think can be extremely powerful in the coming months to assess the health of your customer base. Um, everyone on this call has likely heard of things, tools like Plaid, Yodely, um, Finicity. So these are opportunities to, uh, while engaged with your customer, ask them to collect sorry, connect their bank account information so that you can uh, better understand not just their income over the previous three months, but also how that income may change going forward. So if you can obtain permission from those customers to share that information with you, that can give you a much more robust view of their uh, income stability over the coming months. And I put down here at the bottom, um, this is uh, an opportunity to offer an incentive to those customers for connecting or even for agreeing to sign up for auto payments. So if a customer calls in requesting payment relief, requesting payment deferrals, even requesting a uh, interest rate relief over the coming months, these are things that should absolutely be considered in exchange for extra data. So in exchange for connecting those bank accounts or signing up for auto payment once that loan returns to a payment status. Um, these can be, I think, very powerful tools to, again, win the long term without sacrificing much in the short term. There are other um, data sources as well I'll allude, I, I reference up here, um, utility accounts. We've been talking with a company, Urgenet, which is probably not as widely known, but for subprime lending, um, that can be very powerful in understanding uh, utility payments trends, um, SMB accounting files. There are several vendors out there that connect accounting files, which can help you understand your SMB customer base. And then obviously alternative bureaus. Um, those are uh, not things that we necessarily need customer permission to connect, um, but can be indicative, uh, can provide indications of whether your customers are stretched or not. So if you see the appearance of a high interest rate payday loan in the, um, in the last three months or in the coming months, that can be uh, a good uh, early indicator that your customer is in more distress than you may otherwise know. This slide is meant to just reflect all of the potential data sources. I will not read all of these bullet points, obviously, um, but there are, uh, absolutely useful data information sources that can be used to understand your customer's situation better. Those range from data you get live speaking with or interacting with your customer base to account performance, changes in account performance, product performance, uh, how long have they been customers, how long have they had, say home loans, credit cards, auto loans. You can use those as proxies for LTV on auto and home loans. Uh, macroeconomic data, obviously, even down to the geographic region that this customer might be in. Um, I alluded to third-party data variables in the bottom left. Um, and uh, behavioral variables, customer demographics, bureau information. So customer demographics, obviously, not all this information is actionable, but can help understand, again, your customer's um, 
situation, so things like age, we have seen uh, from some unemployment filing data that younger people, generation, uh, the millennial generation, are more likely to be filing unemployment claims than uh, older generations. And so uh, that information can be useful in understanding your customer base and understanding what they may be facing. And really, as I'll get into us, um, the proof of concept model we've built on resiliency, um, bureau information alone can be very powerful. So there can be indicators in uh, customer behavior leading up to this recession. So not whether they've gone delinquent on loan payments in the last month or two, but did they overextend themselves leading up to the recession that can indicate whether or not they may um, be in position to continue making payments over the next several months. So resiliency indicators, what does that mean exactly? Um, so we have developed a proof of concept resiliency index using data from the Great Recession in 2008 and uh, validated on uh, local natural disasters, Harvey, Sandy, California wildfires, et cetera. And um, we, we've proven that these are powerful and I'll, I'll show that on the next slide. But using these indicators, you can first and foremost identify the accounts in your portfolio that are more likely to go delinquent in the current stressed environment and then develop differentiated strategies targeted at those groups to get out ahead of increased losses. This doesn't, again, mean you're going to prevent all losses, but taking a proactive approach with those customers that are most vulnerable is obviously the smart strategy. Um, can also help you understand just your overall portfolio vulnerability. So not all lending portfolios are created the same. Some are going to have more resilient customers in that, and some will not. And um, obviously, you know, subprime borrowers tend to be less resilient in a downturn. That's not going to change, but even within FICO bands, we have shown the ability to differentiate um, resilient from less resilient customers. And finally, uh, this can be highly powerful in forecasting for purposes of loan loss reserves, et cetera. Uh, and so actually, sorry, before I get to this, I'll, I'll share the results from the fourth question in the poll. How resilient do you think your models or decision logic are to macroeconomic shocks like the ones we are experiencing? 17% um, of you said not at all resilient. Um, 36 said low resilience. 27 moderate resilience and uh, five, sorry, 27 voters, 42% said moderate resilience and finally 5% said high resilience. So I think the bulk of you, um, 78% said low to moderate resilience. Um, and uh, I, I think all models probably have some resilience or the vast majority of models, I think that's probably true, but I, I think it is also true that very few models are built to, to withstand a macro environment like the one we're seeing. And here are the results from our proof of concept model. We, we built this using one of our client partners data that we had back from 2008. And the idea here was to identify customers within a score band that um, identify variables that could predict which of those customers within a score band were more likely to go default in a macroeconomic shock environment than others. And so as you can see here within each of these score bands, 50, 50 point score bands, we were able to identify not just significant sloping, but also um, I think most importantly for the 700 plus FICO range, we were able to identify a small subset that were low resilient. So these are people that the their FICO score does not think are higher risk, but given a macroeconomic shock, they do absolutely reveal themselves to be high probability of default. Um, now, again, this data was built on uh, the time period leading up to the Great Recession and then uh, the bad rate definition here is um, in the recession. And so uh, you're going to see elevated defaults across the board during that recession time period. But uh, I think the takeaway here is this is something that absolutely works and that we strongly recommend all lenders to evaluate for the purposes of differentiating treatment and trying to get out ahead of uh, the defaults that are coming. Okay, and the third recommendation that we are making to our customers that we're, we're working with 
update your exposure management toolkit. As I said earlier, it is very likely that um, collections and uh, account management strategies built and refined over the last 10 years are not optimized for the current environment. And uh, one of the most important things, again, would be number one, uh, take immediate action on identifying decline declining behavior or loss of income. So if a customer does call in and let you know that they are stressed, that is obviously a good opportunity to work with them to um, try and stabilize that payment, uh, offer payment deferrals, offer payment relief uh, in exchange for, ideally in exchange for um, promises to pay or um, even auto payment sign up or uh, the, the best option would be in exchange for increased data um, transparency from that customer. Um, second would be tailor re reactive offers for a customer specific situation. So do not, not all customers are the same. Not all customers have the same outlook in this environment. And um, it really is the uh, recommendation that you work with customers based on their specific situation. So if they have, um, continued income expected and are really just more nervous and worrying, that is, uh, that is not uh, to say you shouldn't work with them, but the, uh, the effort should be spent on those customers that have lost income or uh, anticipate losing income and are uh, you know, providing strong indicators that they will not be able to pay over the next several months. And finally, I think this is an opportunity to actually reopen or expand originations for certain segments. We all know that um, shutting off originations is the easy call in a time period like this, um, but some customers do need credit and actually are credit worthy. So using the data and resiliency indicators available to segment our customers can help us say, okay, which customers have stable income and may be candidates for um, originations. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a bit. That, that does uh, lead to the, uh, the fifth question we asked in the poll. How dramatically have you shut down your lending originations? So 5% of you have completely shut off originations. Um, another 15% have made no change or loosening, which means the remaining 80% have tightened. 28% uh, significant tightening and 52% moderate, moderate tightening. So it um, seems like about 33% of you have completely shut off or significantly tightened originations. Uh, conversely, two thirds of you have done moderate tightening or no change at all. Um, but I think, I think that reflects that everyone wants to be able to originate in this environment, but everyone obviously also wants to originate um, smartly. And so we'll talk over the next few slides about how to do that. Um, so uh, this slide is, is more illustrative. Financial institutions obviously need to make treatment decisions considering not just the customer profile and not just the external environment, but the cross matrix of those two. So um, depending on where we are in the economic cycle, um, right now we're in a worsening crisis with no clear bottom. Um, that said, we will hit a trough and we will start to experience a recovery, hopefully soon. Um, and that's not going to be uh, that economic cycle, I want to stress, is not going to hit all customers the exact same. So some customers in some geographies may already have hit uh, the bottom, and some may um, be uh, still experiencing that downturn. And so uh, differentiating strategies by geography, by sector, uh, by income band, and by level of debt or DTI um, is the smart strategy. Obviously that's easier said than done. Um, and expediency quickness is as important as intelligence. And so there are trade-offs that have to be made, but this is how uh, all credit risk managers should be thinking about decisions in this environment. And this is an illustrative example of the kind of profiling that we think um, can be done using simple overlays like a resiliency index, uh, ideally, additionally overlaying information provided by the customer itself regarding income status. So uh, the first category, stable income, these are the customers that you can hopefully offer new loan options to, offer uh, refinance options. This is someone who can potentially 
um, rebalance their portfolio and you can get them to transfer balances from other lenders at a reduced interest rate um, to increase portfolio growth while, um, while uh, focusing on customers that are stable and resilient. Um, the next group is people who are probably unstable or worried, but may still have uh, employment. So these are people who may have seen furloughs or layoffs at their employer, but not been impacted yet. Um, in these customers, there are uh, reactive offerings you want to be able to make when they call in, uh, including, again, taking the opportunity to try and help them refinance or restructure their debt load so that they can feel stronger and um, more optimistic about their ability to come out the other side. This also offers you as lender the opportunity to position yourselves as a partner in this time period and really take advantage of um, being the first lender paid coming out the other side uh, once things have stabilized. This is also true of this middle group, unemployed but financially solvent. So these are customers who may have already experienced loss of income due to the COVID epidemic. Um, this means that um, I, we believe this is an opportunity to work with those customers, offer debt counseling, offer advice, position yourselves as a partner, and secure commitments for future payment. And this will be, uh, again, uh, opportunity to uh, not just reactively offer payment relief, but also counsel those customers and explain to them how they should be thinking about their debt load and how they should be making decisions in this environment to position, position themselves to come out the other side as strong as possible. These right two groups are gonna be needed to be handled more like traditional collections uh, customers. So unemployed and over indebted, these are customers that uh, probably took on uh, aggressive uh, debt levels due to the uh, long economic growth we'd experienced over the last 10 years and now um, are in trouble. These are uh, customers you want to get out ahead of. You want to try and um, come up with creative solutions, offer debt restructuring, offer loan modifications, extend term, anything you can to keep them paying. Um, and again, these are customers that you really do want to try and get auto payment, sign up, uh, encourage additional information that can help you understand their position. And then finally, unable and unwilling. This is uh, where you want to take more aggressive collections actions, basically treat them like a late stage uh, collections customer, even if they are not currently delinquent, maybe due to uh, payment deferrals. Uh, better account treatment will position your institution to emerge as a trusted partner. So th this is the theme that we've been running through uh, over the last several slides. The recommendation here is again, work with your customers, use the data available, and take targeted intervention. Um, so number one, predictive segmentation can provide a sharper priority list. Prioritize your customers that are telling you either verbally by calling in or um, more likely through the data you can see. Um, to that they are in, in distress or are likely to become in distress soon, uh, that should be used to take timely action. Secondly, targeted intervention through a holistic customer view will lower your costs and losses. So when a customer calls in about their mortgage payment, you should ascertain whether or not you have other loans with them. Or if they call in about one credit card, you may have three other credit cards and not just to them, uh, potentially to their household. And so taking that opportunity to use that information to um, better assess uh, their position and uh, refine your strategy is, is absolutely a, uh, a strong recommendation right now. And finally, um, reopening originations to existing customers that have given you information that shows that they are stable and likely to come out of this uh, in a strong position um, is, is absolutely uh, the, the healthiest and uh, most robust rate way to engage in growth. So net new credit seekers, so people applying for new loans to increase debt load is potentially a red flag, but uh, refinance opportunities, debt consolidation, payment uh, simplification, these are all opportunities to, to continue to grow in an environment in which um, uh, you know, new, safe new originations are going to be hard to come by. So 
looking at your existing customer base, combining that with the information you have and trying to, again, consolidate their debt. Um, ideally through refinance or balance transfer options is, uh, is absolutely a, a safe growth path, especially for customers you have a lot of data on. Finally, talk about, uh, oops, sorry, actions to take immediately. What is next? Um, so these are meant to be things that can be accomplished over the coming weeks. This is not meant to uh, define your strategy over the next three, six, 12 months as we hit bottom on this recession and hopefully start to see a robust recovery. This is, if you have not already done this, uh, now is the time to take action. So first and foremost, uh, conduct a customer level value at risk assessment for your portfolio exposure. So understanding not just um, your exposure by loan type, but your exposure by household type. Again, prioritizing those customers you may have multiple relationships with, not just because of the amount of exposure to those customers, but also because the amount of information you have on those, those customers uh, can be more informative than an, a customer you have a single relationship with. Second, evaluate available data sources to better understand and segment your portfolio. I've hammered this home. Um, it's probably not a action you can take in the next couple of weeks to integrate with Plaid or Yodely for bank account information, but you can uh, do bureau polls. You can run a resiliency analysis on your existing customer base, <coughs> excuse me, to see what information is available and can be indicative of how they will uh, withstand the, um, the challenges and the economic stresses that we are just starting to experience. And again, that, um, that proof of concept model on resiliency index that we built is, uh, was built purely using credit bureau data, it was not built using uh, information that the customers uh, may have provided internally or using any alternative data sources. Uh, so that is something that can be done very quickly. Finally, review and remap your limit management and collection strategies through this lens of resiliency. So figuring out which customers in your portfolio are likely to uh, have payment challenges and separate them from those that are likely to experience um, withstand the economic shocks, at least in the short term, and differentiating treatment accordingly and prioritizing those that are less resilient. And again, these are um, these are customers that can be, can be identified quickly uh, through some basic analysis. Obviously, longer term, you're going to want to reevaluate every one of your models and stress test them and assess them uh, for how they're breaking down in this environment. That said, short term, we we do believe that the information that you have readily available today can be used to differentiate treatments and make smarter decisions for your customers. Okay, with that, I will um, wrap up this portion of the presentation and we'll move into the Q&A portion. Um, please, uh, again, send your questions uh, from the presentation using the Q&A window found in the control bar below. Looks like I've received uh, a handful of questions that I will start to answer, but please continue. Um, to submit those. Uh, first question, what attributes were used to create the resiliency index that I referenced? So um, I won't give away all of our secret sauce, but again, these were um, attributes we pulled from one of the major bureaus. Um, the key indicators that, uh, that were indicative and predictive of customers that were more likely to default than their uh, FICO score would otherwise indicate in a macroeconomic downturn were things like, um, bank card utilization, um, so DTI or proxies for DTI, uh, as well as uh, the Bureau provided DTI approximation. Spend, so ramping up and spend in the months leading up to the recession. Uh, number of credit inquiries, so uh, in the previous 12 months, so things that would again indicate someone was taking on more debt uh, heading into a scenario that they did not anticipate and um, collections uh, items leading up to that period. So obviously uh, presence of collections items in the good times before a recession uh, do not bode well for someone coming 
when that recession hits. Uh, another question, again, related to that, the dependent variable for building the resiliency index. Um, so that was, um, again, just a traditional 24 month uh, bad definition of either 90 days DPD or charge off in the 24 months following the start of the 2008 recession. Another um, question, uh, have we implemented this resiliency score or index with any bank or lender yet? And if so, how well did that go? So uh, again, this was a proof of concept model that we built. We built it for one of our clients who has provided this data um, to us. We have not yet implemented that model uh, at that lender. Um, another question, at this point in time, what would be the best factors to decide on rejection or approval when t making a credit decision? Um, so this is, um, again, I, I alluded to, to a little bit of this earlier. This question was asked at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I think most importantly is use the information you have and target your existing customers. Obviously, some of you are probably still taking new loan applications from prospects, not just existing customers. Um, and, uh, and I would uh, argue that overlaying a resiliency type index on top of any origination scorecard is probably the best strategy for those new prospects. So uh, early indicators that the customer has taken on uh, additional debt that they can't support. Uh, again, the, the um, indicators I just explained, things like ramping up utilization, uh, ramping up spend, DTI, collections, triggers, uh, those are obviously going to be uh, indicators. Um, as well as for a subprime population, uh, you might see, uh, you might uh, want to try to start to incorporate even as just hard rule cuts additional uh, data sources or alternative data sources, things like presence of a um, high interest rate or payday type loan um, could be, uh, if that loan was taken in the months leading up to the recession, so pre kind of March, that would be an indicator that this person is over levering themselves. Um, another indicator could be um, if they have uh, been evicted, uh, this is a, a variable you can get from LexisNexis risk view, evictions in the last three, five years. These, these could be indica indicative of people who are not resilient in good times and therefore very likely to be low resilience in, uh, in a macroeconomic downturn. Uh, next question, the 2008 recession was brought about by Wall Street where businesses were not closed versus this one where businesses are closed. So how effective would a resiliency score be today relative to um, the, the one we've built uh, based on 2008 data? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, the, the short answer is that we, um, we can't say for certain, but we have attempted to validate this proof of concept model on more recent regional um, economic shocks. I talked about the, um, the uh, hurricanes, uh, wildfires. So um, we are using whatever data available. We've also looked, uh, we've looked at, haven't fully validated yet, um, regional recessions. So we know that uh, certain regions of the country have been in recession over the last 10 years, even though the country has experienced uh, overall growth for 10 straight years. So things like, we know parts of Michigan, Detroit area have experienced recessions. Uh, New Mexico and Louisiana have experienced recessions in the last uh, five years, even though the uh, U.S. as a whole has not. And so we're, uh, we're conducting validation efforts to, uh, to uh, confirm that these indicators work uh, on out-of-time samples uh, from what they were built on. That said, I think resiliency as a concept is uh, robust uh, conceptually uh, through uh, regardless of the cause of the downturn. So customers that are over levering themselves in a time period in which economic growth is occurring are more likely to not be able to make payments and meet those debt obligations when that growth stops and layoffs occur. 
Uh, another question, the presentation was mostly focused on retail borrowers. What is your view on SMB loans and how can this resilience analysis be adapted to them? That's a great question. Um, the unfortunate truth is that I think SMB borrowers are in a much more precarious position right now than consumers. Consumers um, are getting lifelines from the federal government, uh, have received um, federal unemployment, do are eligible for state level unemployment, um, whereas SMB bailouts through the PPP program, while um, while they've been great initiatives, probably are not enough. And uh, the reality is that even in parts of the country where business is uh, slowly reopening, uh, we we all know that consumers are not going to return immediately in the uh, in the volumes that they previously uh, had shopped at. Uh, if you're talking about retail or restaurants, uh, uh, anything that requires face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and and uh, you're right in asking this question that the, uh, the data availability for those um, small businesses are, is likely not as robust as um, in, uh, in the consumer space. That said, there are several data sources that I would recommend. One is exploring the option to connect into their um, their accounting file information. I know that's not an overnight uh, fix, but there are several solutions out there that let you connect to a small business owner's QuickBooks or um, or uh, whatever online uh, cloud-based accounting program they're using, and can uh, you can immediately see what has happened to their revenue if you can get that information. You can look at a even if it requires a human review, you can look at their revenue trends over the last. Uh, three, six, 12 months and see if they've seen that drop off that the vast majority of businesses have. Another uh, option would be overlaying industry type. So this does not require uh, hopefully new information. Uh, hopefully you're already asking that information at application stage. But again, not all uh, small businesses are being impacted in the same way. So retail restaurants, those are going to be in pretty bad shape even, uh, even as things start to reopen. And so I would treat those sectors differently than I would uh, something like a, a service provider that doesn't require face-to-face -face interaction. And um, I will stress if you're trying to, I don't know if the question is focused more on um, uh, an existing portfolio or taking new applications. I think for new applications, it's, uh, it's probably important to cut out some sectors and severely restrict others. And, honestly make the application process a little harder for SMBs. You probably want to get on a phone and actually ask that uh, business owner what their position is if you can't collect, sorry, connect to their accounting files. Um, for existing portfolios, I think you can uh, start to use indicators. Um, if you have a small business owner and you have their, um, their personal credit information, which most small business lenders do, take the personal credit information from the business owner. You can use those indicators from their personal bureau of the owner to, uh, to reflect treatment on that small business. Um, small business bureaus are unfortunately bad in, uh, in the best of times. There, there just isn't uh, enough timely data available to see small business uh, performance. That said, there are alternative small business bureaus and we've spoken with several um, that do see uh, things like payment information to their suppliers. And so there are alternative data sources as well. Again, not overnight fixes, but things that you can plug into to see which of your um, our customers are, are paying their vendors and which not. Uh, that said, again, the, the best solution is going to be um, industry, sector, geographic region, the owner of the business, and then finally, anything you can get directly from that small business owner, getting on the phone with them and, and really trying to understand their situation. The good news with small business lenders is they probably have fewer number of loans um, because the average loan size is so much bigger than a consumer lender. So that is something that is potentially possible to, uh, to actually get on the phone with them. And um, I've got, uh, I think we're, Running out of time, uh, I'll take one last question. Um, uh, sorry, just scanning through here. Um,
Could you suggest minimum vintage for funding to existing customers? Um, I'm not sure exactly what this question is trying to ask. Um, uh, I, I speculate uh, how much, the question is around how much information you would need from an existing customer to uh, consider expanding uh, or you know, offering additional debt to them. Uh, so I talked about wanting to target customers that have uh, a lot of information available. Can you, um, can you use that information to identify customers eligible for additional debt? And I think this is, um, the reality is it depends on the, the level of information. I, I mean, if you can connect to their bank accounts and if you can uh, pull alternative bureau sources and, and pull in additional information, you, should, uh, you shouldn't have to have a long relationship with that customer. Uh, that said, I would prioritize customers you have long relationships with because, again, they are going to, um, I think, remember how you treat them in this downturn and how you worked with them. And uh, the stronger that relationship and the longer that relationship, uh, the more likely they are to, uh, to pay, repay you when, when times become good. But I, I don't think there's some sort of magic number or some minimum time you must have had a customer. I think it's really around the level of data you get from them. Okay, and with that, I will wrap up. There are a few more questions that I, sorry, I wasn't able to get to, um, but thank you all uh, for your time. And uh, we will respond to those last handful of questions uh, directly over email if we have your information. Thank you.